Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors. This is Rochelle Vanderzanden here. I've got Corey on the line with me, too. Hey. Hey. And, you know, maybe you've been listening to our podcast for a while now. And if you have been, thanks. We appreciate it. (laughs) But second, like, do you feel like you have a lot of clarity when it comes to your finances? Like, we call this financial clarity. But I think that's somewhat hard to achieve for most people because there's a lot of different things to talk about, a lot of different things to tackle. And we do our best. But a lot of times it, it can be helpful to have someone looking over your shoulder and answering your specific questions. So today's episode is a little bit about like, do you need a financial advisor? And like, what kind of people is a financial advisor really helpful for? In what situations is it maybe a little bit less helpful? So we're going to go through that. I think we are obviously biased. We are financial advisors. We think (laughs) that people can benefit from having financial advisors or else we wouldn't do this, period. And you can read a lot of blogs out there that might try to help you do it yourself and things like that. It can be helpful to have someone looking over your shoulder just to have someone answer specific questions, but it's different for everyone. So we're just going to walk through a few different examples of different types of people and how they may approach finances and whether or not those types of folks can potentially help get some help from an advisor. And obviously not everyone's going to fit into a clean category, but I think Corey and I have been doing this for a little while, and there's lots of people that kind of fall into these different little buckets when we're dealing with them. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, of course, we're biased. Um, It's like if you ask a painter- (laughs) Full disclosure. Yeah, if they should paint your house, the answer is yes. You know, we think probably most people, even people that are very capable of managing their own finances, there could be some value added from working with a financial advisor. Um, but this episode is is by no means meant to be a pitch on why you should or need to. It's you know here's the you know different scenarios where it could make sense, and then you know here's a scenario where you might be in a good position to manage it on your own. Um, you know, and, and to each their own. But yeah, I, I would say probably the majority of people probably could and should benefit from working with a financial advisor and. You know, there's a reason we have jobs and our practices are more or less full. Can't really take on too many more clients at this point, you know, because there is a demand for financial advice. So, yeah, I um, guess one thing that I didn't mention in the outline, so I'm just going to mention it here real quick, is that there are different levels of advice, too. You know, like there's some people who want a lot of support and you can get a lot of support from an advisor. And there's other people who just want a spot check once in a while. So it doesn't have to be a one size all fits thing. Or so, you know, if you like, that didn't make sense at all, but you know what I'm saying? If you a one size <laughs> fits just, all. Yeah, that's the word. One size but all you, fits. <laughs> you can tell that I have small children and they, yeah, or a small child anyway. <laughs> but basically you can get a little bit of support if you need a little bit of support. That is an option. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, maybe we do another episode at some point on different types of financial yeah. planners or advisors or you know models or whatnot but uh but anyways so types of people you know if you're listening to this trying to decide if you should or need to work with a financial advisor maybe you've been doing it yourself for a while but thinking it might be time to to get that uh, you know next level so we, we kind of put together some different categories or types of people this is by no means completely um comprehensive and you know so you, you might have some overlap between different categories here. So, you know, several different uh, people. We'll start with the nervous, people that are very uncomfortable with money. And, you know, there's there's a lot of different reasons that you might be uncomfortable managing your own finances, whether that be from a bad experience in the past or lack of education, just lack of confidence, you know, if we're not familiar with something or, you know, we haven't had, a, you know, some great uh, experiences before that that can definitely hurt your confidence, um, just lack of time. You know, you just don't have the time to make yourself feel comfortable with it. And uh, no, you know, nothing wrong with that either. Um, <clears throat> you know, but uh, but yeah, you know, the, I think that's a, a big a big factor for a lot of people is just, you know, money is not a comfortable topic. You know, they may not have grown up talking about it. It wasn't really a, a, a subject of discussion in their house. You know, it's still... To this day, it's becoming a little better, I feel like, especially with the growth of the internet, but it still is kind of a taboo topic to discuss amongst friends. You know, Rochelle and I are trying our hardest to change that, but, you know, it's, it, it is uncomfortable for some people. 
Yeah, no one wants to sit around the dinner table talking about their student loan debt, you know? <laughs> but, yeah. Well, yeah. Where do you want to take it from here? I don't know. So with these folks, I do think that I have a lot of clients that fall into this category that are really, really just nervous and scared that either something is going to go wrong or, you know, that they're they're going to mess it up if they do it or and and sometimes they do nothing just not because they don't want to be productive with their money, but because doing something feels too scary. And I think those are the kind of people that an advisor can be very helpful for because one, you can learn a little bit to get a little bit more comfortable with the things that you can potentially do with your money. But second, they can help you do it. <laughs> you know, like if you don't if you don't feel comfortable doing it on your own, they can help you execute. Um, and that can mean a few different things. It can mean, you know, helping manage money. It can mean, you know, just reviewing things with you once in a while. So even if you're a little bit uncomfortable with what it looks like, just having someone kind of hold your hand, honestly, can be really helpful. And I think it makes sense sometimes to be uncomfortable with money. Like not everyone grew up around money or talking about money. And so, you know, get a little help if if that's the case. Yeah. I think a lot of people fall in. I think there's probably two primary categories. We'll get to another one. Um, you know, the delegators of people who who want financial advisors, but these, you know, the nervous category definitely recognize it and, and they're, you know, very inclined to reach out and get that support because, you know, they don't want to, they don't have the confidence to do it themselves. They're like, hey, I'll stay in my lane with my profession. Let's hire someone else to that knows what they're doing for this, for this avenue. So, and that's, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of industries and businesses, you know, you go to a mechanic to get your car fixed. Nothing wrong with that. Um, it's not something you want to learn how to do or, you, you know, you feel confident doing yourself. So get someone to do it for you. Yep. The next category of people that we have may not get advice ever, <laughs> but I like to think of them as like the deniers, the people that just pretend that money doesn't exist. You know, they get it in their bank account, they spend it, they get it in their bank account, they spend it, but they don't spend any time thinking about it. They don't process like what is happening with my money. And, you know, chances are those folks might not be listening to this podcast. <laughs> You may know some of those folks, but you're probably not listening <laughs> or or seeking advice from an advisor. And there's lots of people that there are lots of reasons that people may choose to ignore money. You know, some people are overspending and they know it and they'd rather not acknowledge that. Like they know it in the back of their brain, but they don't want to look at it. They don't want to see that they are racking up credit card debt or anything like that. Maybe they're not saving. And they don't want to think about that either. Like if I talk to someone, they're going to tell me I'm not saving enough for retirement, which I already know. But if someone says it to my face, then I have to do something about it. Um, And then there's other people that assume that because they make a good income, that it's just going to be fine. You know, everything's just going to fall into place. I don't have to think about this. I have money. So I don't have to worry about managing my money. And then there's the opposite people who assume that because they're not making very much money right now, that there's just nothing they can do about it anyway. So why bother? And that's hard. I think that sometimes people fall into that that kind of trap when they're in training. And it may not be that you can do a ton of really proactive things with your money, but there's always something that you can be doing to just sort of put yourself in a good position and just be as efficient as possible. And that's still something an advisor could potentially help you with. And eventually... You know, you've got to kind of face the music, whether it's because you have to and you're forced to or, you know, you decide to. And hopefully it's the the latter. Hopefully you decide to at some point. For sure. Let's see. The delegators. So these people, very capable, you know, of managing their own money. They just don't have the time or desire to do it. You know, they may have some knowledge, may have some confidence surrounding it, but they just don't want to which is fine. You know, perfectly fine. I'm very capable of cleaning my own house. Don't want to do it. You know, let's hire a house cleaner <laughs> to do it for me. Yeah, you know, I don't want to scrub toilets. It's not that difficult. I know what, you know, cleaning products and tools to use to get it done, but not my favorite thing. Um, nothing wrong with that. Some people just don't have an interest in managing their own finances. Um, they want to delegate that, outsource it so they can spend their free time doing something more enjoyable to them. 
You know, and this is, I think, a lot of people, especially physicians, you know, you guys are, are, are very intelligent human beings. You're very capable of learning the ropes and getting a good understanding of how to handle finances. It's just, you know, you, you got a busy careers, you got families, you got hobbies. It's just, there's just not enough time in the day to, to tackle it all. And it's not an enjoyable money managing finances, investing is just not an enjoyable activity for you, which is perfect. You know, that's why we exist. Outsource it to us to do it for you. Um, you know, just like all the other things that you can outsource, you know, there's a lot of things in life you can do on your own, or you can outsource it to someone else for a, a, a small cost. And, uh, you know, that's very common for people. And, um, you know, it's our job to, sorry, dog barking. <laughs> it's our job <laughs> to spend all day. Um, you know, staying on top of finances and we have the time carved out in our, you know, work weeks to do that where, you know, a lot of people just don't have the time in their personal hours to to tackle finances as well, along with all the other things that they have going on. Absolutely. Yep. I think we, yeah, there's a another category of people that may feel okay about finances, but don't have the education, you know, like there's not really a broad financial education that is offered to people across the board. Like you might learn a little bit in high school about personal finance. And then after that, you choose what you learn, really, when you're in college and beyond. And if you're focused on medicine, it's probably not going to be personal finance stuff. Like you don't need to do that in order to get, you know, your prereqs done for med school and in order to go through med school. So a lot of times people just don't have the information and they may be perfectly capable of learning it, but it can be hard to find good resources. Um, you know, it's just things like basics, like how to tackle debt repayment, how much you can afford to to spend on a house, how much it costs to raise kids, like all of these really big, really important questions that we don't have a lot of good information on because we haven't been taught. And there, it's really possible to go out there and find some of this information on your own. There's lots of books that have been written. There's blogs. There's podcasts. You're listening to this one. But you can often find contradictory information. You know, like one book may tell you one thing. Another book tells you another one, which is right. Like, it depends, right? <laughs> That's always the answer. It depends. Because it depends on, like, what your situation is. And that is what can lead us to potentially the right inf in information, the right answer, but none of that information is tailored specifically for you. So if you can find the right advisor, they can be very helpful in educating you on the basics. But I think a big caveat here is that not all advisors do that. Not all of them think that that's their job. And, and honestly, you know, maybe it's not. Maybe they're more wealth managers. Maybe they're more like, you know, we're going to do X, Y, Z. Please just do what I tell you to do. But if you find the right advisor, sometimes you can get some basic education to help you learn. And maybe it still makes sense to work with them longer term. Maybe you spend some time with them. You learn what you need to learn. And then you become a DIYer, which is going to be our next topic. But it, it can be very helpful just to get the basics to get the lay of the land and you and do that in a context where you can apply it to your personal situation. And that can be done with an advisor. And that can be really helpful when you're in training too, you know, just to to get some basics to get a good foundation going before you, you know, start working and making money and putting all of this money towards all of your goals. I think that part of the, the crux of the issue is just it's such a broad finances are, are such a broad subject it's challenging to get the right education for your circumstances at the right time too like it, it's it's hard to make it relevant like it, you know we can't really teach like middle schoolers or high schoolers a lot of this stuff because it's just not relevant to them it's not going to stick in right. their brains you know like you know, what are the different student loan repayment methods? Well, that's not really applicable until you're done with your training. You know, it's like, what types of investments should I do? You know, Roth IRA income limit, like there's just so much stuff to learn about, you know, but what's the right stuff for you specifically to learn about? And yeah, like Rochelle said, that's where having a good advisor, if you're, you know, this is honestly, this is how Rochelle, you 
got into this career is <laughs> you're uneducated, but you had an interest in learning about it. And, um, you know, you, we got you on the right track and now you're with us. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, that it's, you know, for those of you that want to learn more, um, you know, my hat's off to you, but yeah, it's finding, you know, where's the right place to learn it and what's the right stuff you need to learn for your circumstances. Cause personal finances, it's a lot more personal than finance. There's a lot of gray area, you know, no, there's very few absolute right or wrong answers. Um, you know, so, so <clears throat> challenging to develop the appropriate level of education for your circumstances, you know, using, you know, self-taught or, you know, trying to find it yourself. Or even if you like went to a course or a class, like you found, you know, some night college class on personal finances that's offered by the local community college or or university or whatever, even that it's not going to, 90% of the material won't necessarily be applicable to you and your circumstances. Um, So it it is challenging to get the right education. Um, Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You work with a good advisor that, that can teach you the things applicable to you, then yeah, you can build upon it from there. And none of this is to say that you shouldn't try. I think that this is a a very valuable pursuit, trying to to educate yourself on personal finance. And the more you know, the better off you'll be. Um, But, you know, it can be helpful just to touch base with someone too. Yeah, get in the direction of what you need to learn is, Absolutely. is helpful. And yeah, the, I mean, thanks to the internet, we we can it's it's you can find the right avenues. But even so, like you can get down some rabbit holes and you're going the wrong direction um, if you're not careful. But. Yep. So that kind of brings it to the the do it yourself folks. <laughs> and if this is you, like way to go. I I have a lot of clients who've done a lot or. Or maybe some clients that have moved on, honestly, who've done a lot to educate themselves and very aggressively pursue their financial goals. Like, this is what I want to achieve. And sometimes I'm like, this is a little over the top, honestly. <laughs> Once in a while, you you come across people, it's like, this is, you know, it, it's like it's a hobby for them too. So obviously, like, we're not going to discourage that at all. But you can tell they spend quite a bit of time like on their budget spreadsheets and on their projections of when their student loans are going to be paid off and like, you know, squirreling away all of their resources into these different buckets to make sure they achieve their goals. And like, the, here's their five-year goals. Here's their 10-year goals. Like you have a lot of people that get really, really into the weeds with this. And sometimes they may be doing a little bit too much, you know, and that's not necessarily a problem unless you're getting into it and you're really like over trading, like you're super concerned about your asset allocation. So you're going there and you're like adjusting things all the time and stuff like that. And that can be really counterproductive sometimes, but that's not applicable for everyone. You know, not everyone that's a do it yourself or does that kind of thing. But, you know, if you have some basics, if you kind of understand and accept that you have some biases that you're susceptible to. If you kind of appreciate that you need to be saving and investing, and if you accept things like timing the market is really kind of close to impossible, like we're not going to be able to do that consistently, so stop trying. And if you understand other things like statistically investing in a broadly diversified stock portfolio will probably give you a better return over time than investing in individual stocks. And you really want to learn about financial planning and investing and tax implication and rules and regulations and all of that kind of stuff, then you could be a really good candidate to do without a financial advisor. That's kind of a long list. You know, it's a lot to learn and it's a lot to understand about yourself because I think one of the big advantages that you can have with an advisor is just to be able to to remove yourself a little bit from the emotional aspects of it. So that that's probably one of the hardest things to do as a do-it-yourselfer. Yeah. I mean, even if you're, you know, know everything there is possibly to know, you're still a human. You have blind spots, you have emotions. So even having that sounding board to, you know, spot check and run things by is helpful. And then going from the, you know, the uneducated to educated to do it yourself or level, um, you know, it's one thing to learn how to do something, you know, how to open a Roth IRA, how to invest, how to trade, how to, et cetera, et cetera. It's another thing to to learn why that makes sense and why it's important. Um, Because, and once you can start to 
capture that why behind it, that's when it really starts to click and you can understand if this is an appropriate action for you or investment for you or, or strategy for you. And, um, you know, that's where that making it, a, you know, that leap to do it yourself level um, is possible is once you start understanding the why behind all these different r- rules and, and, uh, and strategies. Um, mm-hmm. But I think, yeah, just having that eagerness to learn and because uh, uh, things change over time, rules change, laws change, taxes change, um, you know, what a, a, an applicable strategy, you know, 15 years ago, you know, may not be appropriate today and stuff that's appropriate today may not be appropriate 15 years from now, you know, like mm-hmm. Roth IRAs are a relatively new thing the backdoor Roth IRA is even more recent you know it's uh, you know it's only been around for about 13 years and then you know defined you know benefit or or defined contribution retirement plan limits you know change over time so how much you could be saving the types of retirement plans you can use um, student loan stuff I mean that's changed a ton in just the last few years you know for the better arguably a lot of people have been able to benefit from loan forgiveness opportunities there's just so much again that you know not all of it's applicable to everyone but the stuff that is applicable to you you know staying on top of it learning about it you know like rochelle said it's almost like a hobby you enjoy it you know that's rochelle and i enjoy this stuff we read books in our free time about personal finances and you know we read articles you know daily there's blog posts etc so it's, it's a you know, in addition to a job, it is a hobby because we we enjoy learning about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, if that's also you, then my hat's off to you, and you're probably in a good position to do it yourself. Um, you know, yeah. if you have the time and desire to do that. Yeah, I think the bottom line with these folks is that with or without an advisor, most most of those folks are probably going to be fine. You know, and if you do work with an advisor, it's very likely that they can provide some improvements on the margins, you know, like helping you use your resources efficiently. Like, you know, like I should pay down my debt. I should be investing. But, you know, like what's the the best possible option for this bucket of money and that kind of things. Um, and maybe I think some of the more boring things sometimes get neglected with do-it-yourselfers, like insurances and estate planning and kind of things like that. Like, you know, there's some check the box things that might get missed if we're doing it on our own. But but again, probably going to be fine. It's just probably a little bit helpful to touch base with someone once in a while. I think the more you save as a percentage of your income, like if you're saving 50% of your income, even if you pick the worst investments and do like, you know, silly and like non-tax efficient strategies, um, <laughs> you know, like it's going to be hard to screw things up. Like you'll eventually become financially independent just because you're saving such a large amount of your earnings. So I think that's another component that that can definitely help um, increase the odds of success when going on your own is if you're just saving a, a ridiculously large amount of, of your income. Absolutely. So, you know, we could definitely add value, make things more efficient and optimized for you. Um, but, you know, kind of hard to screw up when you're, you're saving a ton, which is Yeah. Nice. A lot of the really successful, like do it yourself bloggers are those people. You know, and that and that's why they're so successful is because they're saving so much as a portion of their income, which is really powerful. Yeah, high income, low expenses, save a ton rather than spend it, and uh, recipe for success. Absolutely. So. Yep. Let's see. Wrap things up here. You know, there's numbers of studies out there about the value of an advisor, like Vanguard. You know, they're. Theirs is, is probably one of the most cited I've seen, but other companies like Morningstar have done similar studies and basically, and they tend to update them every year or so, um, maybe every couple of years, but it, the basically their, their data concludes that you know advisors add value over time. It's not in a linear fashion. It usually comes in chunks or you know, specifically around big, you know, life-changing decisions that you may not know in the moment. Um, you know, like, do we sell or buy or, you know, stay the course with this investment? You know, market's down. Are we panicking? That's probably the classic example. If you sell and go to cash, miss out on the ensuing growth, 
you know, you're, you're, you're setting yourself back years potentially from being able to achieve financial independence. But, um, I think the biggest, uh, variables that they find are, you know, helpful, uh, behavioral coaching, which I think is a terrible, you know, term. No <laughs> one wants to accept that they're they they have poor behavior and they need help. Um, but for lack of a better <laughs> Uh, term i guess it's like why would you you know why do you go to a personal trainer you need help learning how to do things and, and the, the regimen to be on you know why would and you someone go to, to hold you accountable <laughs> yeah i think that's yeah the the accountability factor is huge um i think that if nothing else just having that someone to hold you accountable you know periodic regular checks stay on top of things um when left to our own devices can can slip by the wayside but but yeah the accountability is big Behavioral coaching, just, you know, making sure we, you know, keep our emotions in check when, specifically when it comes to investing and maybe some spending decisions as well. Um, portfolio construction, you know, there's plenty of like, you know, free resources out there and, and low costs, you know, uh, you know, programs, you know, the, the quote unquote robo advisors that can build portfolios for you, but being able to create optimal, efficient portfolios, especially on the taxable account side of things, making sure we're operating in a tax efficient manner, especially with when you're living in the higher income brackets, like many of you are or will be. And then, um, you know, there's asset allocation and location kind of falls into that category. Um, but, but that's only on the wealth management side of things. It doesn't really get into like student loan decisions, which for doctors specifically can be huge. I mean, those can be you know, six figure decisions there that, that we could be making um, and, 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 you know, other stuff just on the planning side of it. So if, you know, a company like Vanguard saying advisors can add value specifically pertaining to investments, doesn't even get into all the other stuff that, that real financial planners do for you, um, you know, which in some cases can be hard to, harder to quantify, um, you know, because, you know, there's not always a dollar figure attached to it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to quantify something like that. I think one of the biggest things that we try to do as advisors is really like get down to the nitty gritty of what are your goals and how do we use your resources to achieve those goals? And like a robo advisor can't do that for you. Like that's that's something that you've got to try to figure out on your own or with some help. And I think that that's, that's a conversation that sometimes you don't even have with yourself. And so it can be really valuable to work with someone and kind of work through some of those things. And there's, you know, that peace of mind factor, again, getting to the hard yeah. to quantify, you know, for some people, it's just, you know, you'd sleep better at night knowing that you have confidence in your financial strategy. Um, and, yeah. you know, the, you know, other scenarios, you know, could be easier to quantify. Like I have a client, they're getting into a new house and looking at mortgages and and the mortgage person they were working with showed them, you know, a, a one quote and I, you know, looked at it and I was like, well, I feel like you could get a better deal through another place. You know, here's a few contacts for you. And sure enough, was able to save them, I think over 1% interest, which on the size of their mortgage is, you know, probably going to amount to a six figure sum over the course of their, you know, mortgage payoff timeline. So, I mean, there are, mm -hmm. you know, little just having the resources available to kind of know what's going on in the world. But yeah. Um, Even just telling people to park their money in a high interest savings account instead of leaving it in their like bank they have since that they were 10, you know, yeah, there's <laughs> thousands of dollars a year in interest right there for just yeah. taking five minutes to set up a bank account. Do that if you haven't already. Yeah. If not you're not using a high interest savings account, <laughs> like there's really no reason you shouldn't. You're getting 4% interest these days versus 0. 0.004 at your typical bank checking account. Yeah, exactly. Free money. Take it. You're welcome. Yep. <laughs> no charge for that one. <laughs> well, thank you for listening, everyone. If you ever have questions for us, you know where to find us. I think, you know, it, it's different for everyone. And, you know, this is a choice you can kind of make together as a family if you have a family and, and you'll figure it out one way or another. You're you're listening. So you care. And I think that that matters. Yep. Thanks. Talk to you next time.